welcome to episode three of the Bowtie Guy podcast. Today, I'm going to discuss MBTI, and you're like, man, I ain't got time for more alphabet soup. But you know what? Since the dawn of time, humans have drawn up schematics to describe, to categorize our personalities. From the four temperaments of the ancient civilizations to the latest advances in psychology, you and I, we have been driven to fit the variables, the complexities of human personality into a cookie cutter, well-defined model. Although we are still some way away from being able to do that, the current models account for most of our important personality traits. And you know what? Can ooby dooby predict our behavior with a high degree of accuracy? <laughs> what? Yeah, there's 16 personalities according to Myers-Briggs. Personality is just one of the many factors that guide our behavior. You and I, even our children. Our actions are influenced by our environment, our background knowledge, our socioeconomic status, our experiences that some of us have experienced things that you don't want to experience. Some of us have experienced such great childhoods that it should be shared. And you know what? Our actions have also been influenced by our individual goals. We're going to take a moment in this MBTI episode. Hopefully we'll try to describe how people belong to a specific personality type and how they're likely to behave. You know what? There's indicators that we can look into this. There's tendencies that we can look into this. And you know what? Just with anything, don't, don't typecast anyone. This isn't as definitive as you would like to think. This isn't iconoclastically definitive, whereas you are this, you are that. This gives us a great indication. This is a tool to help inform us, to motivate us into being the best people we can be, but also utilizing that great trait that God gave us, empathy, putting ourselves in other people's shoes. Did you know that significant differences can exist even among people who share a personality type. I'm going to get into that in just a second. Look, your brother from another mother, the bow tie guy, I have a personality that 99% of the entire population, they don't have. <laughs> One, 1%. One that is the total of the population that has INFJ, and I'll explain that a little bit later. Now, I want to... I want to drop this knowledge on you, MBTI. I want to drop it on you as a means to inspire personal growth within you, personal growth within the collection of people that you have around you. And you know what? To really enhance the relationships that you have. Don't take this stuff as gospel. Lord have mercy. We're smarter than that. It's a tool, so let it be a tool. You know what? It dates back to the early 20th century. And you know what? The MBTI process was the brainchild of Carl Gustav Jung, the father of analytical psychology. You know what? Jung had a theory of psychological types. And you know what? It's probably the most influential creation in personality typology. And it has even inspired a number of different theories. One of Jung's key contributions was the development of the concept of introversion, that's someone who is just fine being to themselves. They are introspective. They are intrapersonal. Then you have extroverts. This extroversion, if you will, the X in the prefix means outward. The N in introversion means inward. Extroversion, that means you seek fulfillment. You get your energy from outside of yourself. Introverts, they tend to create energy. They're energized by getting alone time. You know what? His theory was that each of us fall into a specific category, the one of two categories. Either you're an introvert or you're not. <laughs> you're an introvert or you're an extrovert. And you know what? He even took time to focus on the internal world. That is that introvert. In the outside world, that is the extrovert. Here's what you need to understand as well. He coined the concept of so-called cognitive functions. Let me say that again. Cognitive function. Now, what are these things? Cognitive functions. They are separated into judging 
or perceiving categories. According to Young, each person prefers one of these cognitive functions and may most re uh, naturally rely on it in everyday situations. Now, we all are born with the ability to judge, to appraise, to evaluate. Those are some higher orders of thinking. Perceiving or finding a perception is utilizing the information that you have. It's schema, drawing conclusions, making inferences. That's a skill in its own right. So check it before you wreck it. In the 1920s, Young's theory was noticed by Catherine Cook Briggs. This, this cat right here, this lady, she later co-authored a personality indicator that is still widely and universally acclaimed and utilized today. It's called the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator. That's what this episode's all about, MBTI. Briggs was a teacher. Ha! Huh. I wonder why I, Bowtie Guy, am talking about this process, this typology on my podcast. You know what? What a great mechanism, tool, employment that we can use to better understand the students around us. <coughs> Let it be known that Briggs was a teacher, a reacher, a preacher like you and I, with an avid stake and interest in personality typing, having developed her own type theory before even learning of Young's writings. Together with her daughter, Isabel Briggs Myers. Now, you know what? That's a great shared activity right there. <laughs> Creating, inventing a typology for personalities that can bring this world, this collection of talent that is all throughout the world together. That is sweet. Together, they developed a convenient way to describe the order of each person's Jungian pref uh, preferences. This is how the four-letter acronyms were born. Now, just a little caveat. You are not composed entirely, completely, exclusively of four letters. You're so much more than that. And if no one tells you that, hey, the bow tie guy just told you that. You're loved. Of course, you know what? We don't we don't need to oversimplify what we have here in the Myers-Briggs theory. You need to understand that we define personality types and traits differently in this particular model. So we're not going to go into Jungian concepts. I'm not going to confuse you anymore. So here's what you need to know about the four-letter naming model. Due to its simplicity and ease of use, the four-letter naming model that I've talked about, see, I'm an INFJ, it's been embraced by a number of diverse theories and approaches over the last few decades, including psychological frameworks such as socionics, the Kiersey temperament sorter, and Linda Barron's interaction styles, in addition to a wide variety of others. Now you need to understand that while the acronyms used by these theories may be identical or very similar, however their meanings do not always overlap. So just because you think that you're an introvert does not mean that you, you and I are going to be thicker than thieves. Look, there's eight different types of introverts. There's eight different types of extroverts. Yes, that 16 is a wide spectrum of possibilities that we could be. This is fascinating stuff. Think about how it could be utilized potentially in the construct of typing, personality typing our students. So we better understand their strengths and weaknesses and you know what? In practicing self-efficacy and team efficacy, maybe it would be a great advantage that the team, the, the teachers, the, the faculty members, the administration, the students, we were all in one accord, all in a great construct of fidelity where we're typing, we're, we're, we're not typecasting, but we are identifying our personality so we better understand ourselves and we better understand the collection of people around us. Now, you need a big introduction to MP MBTI because you know what? There, you, you can't easily define each designation, each acronym. Each theory defines them iconoclastically, individually, exclusively in their own unique way. And it is entirely possible that you, in the course of your life, will meet five people who all say, baby, I'm an INFJ. But <laughs> their definitions of INFJ, what it means, hey, it's going to be different. They're going to contrast from one another. So let's talk about types and traits. 
Regardless of its structure, any type-based theory will struggle to describe or characterize people whose scores lie near a dividing line. This is where it can get kind of confusing. So we need to take a different way, a different method, to look at the personalities through the lens of a trait-based aspect rather than a type-based model. What do we mean by that? So when we're talking about this, instead of creating an arbitrary number of categories and attempting to fit people within them, a trait-based model simply studies the degree to which people exhibit certain identifiable traits. Now, you may have heard the term ambivert, and you're like, speak English, son. Now, an ambivert is the perfect example in this particular case. Ambiversion means that someone falls in the middle of the introversion-extroversion scale. Look, it's complicated. Some of us need that time to ourselves, but we don't have any problem whenever it is a planned activity where we know that we're gonna be exerting a lot of our finite energy into meeting the needs of others. Now, this particular person who is ambiverted, they're not too particularly outgoing and they're not too particularly withdrawn. Here's what you need to understand. Trait-based theories would simply say that an ambivert is moderately extroverted and moderately introverted and just leave it at that without even assigning a personality type. Now, because we wanna utilize a trait-based approach, it makes it much easier to, with reliability with fidelity, with consistency, to measure, to appraise the correlations between personality traits and other characteristics. You know what? Even looking at political attitudes, this is why trait-based approaches dominate psychometric research. This is big, y'all. But that's more or less the only area, the only exclusive area where these approaches are dominant. Because they don't offer types or categorizations, trait-based theories don't translate well as type-based theories into specific recommendations and takeaways. Assigned categories such as extrovert or introvert may be limiting, and they may have their own shortcomings for, all, for, for that matter, but they allow us as typers of personality. Ha, I like that coin. Now, it may al allow us to conceptualize human personality as we know it and create theories about, hey, why we do what we do. Now, something that may be a little bit more scientific, scientifically reliable, but it's a colorless statement, such as the 37% that are extroverted, hey, they just can't do that. Now, here's what you need to understand. There is a lot of validity and there's a lot of reliability with typing in MBTI. I wanna challenge you, check out a personality test on the internet and, and you know what the, the 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 best one that i've found is just 16personalities.com now if you go to 16 you use the numbers 1616personalities.com you will take a pretty lengthy and comprehensive test and you'll understand because it's on a spe each question is not yes or no it's like on a spectrum so how much or how um how little you feel about something and so it, it's kind of taking a spray at it and it's, get, it's trying to formulate a reliable and uh, appropriate uh, metric of what kind of per personality type you have this is big y'all this is the, the big implications here is that if you can type which means if you can evaluate perhaps maybe the faculty at a school just the faculty well perhaps maybe the scheduling that you do maybe the the, the teaming that you do, the, the collection of talent that you put in this grade or that grade or in this pod, that pod, perhaps maybe you go to something that is reliable, scientifically relevant. Perhaps maybe you choose Myers-Briggs. MBTI is where it's at, folks. A lot of implications for growth. A lot of implications for carrying this over from adults into the network of education where we actually try to appraise and evaluate uh, the information we know about these kids and it will really give us a roadmap, a cultivating roadmap, of how we can really stretch these kids to the, to the outer reaches of their abilities and get them to really exceed and excel because research proves, a research-based strategy is that, you know what, when you're accelerated, when you're accelerating a learner based on interest instead of what the curriculum mandates, baby, you might as well aim your target at the moon because you're gonna be off the chain. Now, we can push the needle by better understanding each other and the students that we teach. Well, what are you waiting for? Go ahead and take your test. Let me know how you type. Now, I'm an INFJ, like I said, I'd love to know what you are. Now, if you feel free, you wanna share some information with me and if you want to inquire a little bit more about MBTI, 
or if you have any questions or comments about this particular podcast, I'd love to invite you to email me at Horton, H-O-R-T-O-N, like Horton Here's Who, if I haven't heard that a million times, Horton, E-D-U, E-D-U for education, but E-D-U, at gmail.com. Holla at your boy. We'll check you out in episode four. The podcast you just heard was made using Anchor. Ever thought about making your own podcast? Anchor makes it really easy for anyone to get started. It's a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing podcasts. Best of all, it's 100% free. Sign up now at anchor.fm slash new. That's anchor.fm slash new to get started.